Welcome to The Christian Atheist, Episode 10, Part 2, The Denouement. Around the time of my wife's death in February of 2019, I was in church, listening to a sermon on the book of Joshua. My mind wandered to a principle of philosophy that is familiar to my listeners. If you want to know what someone truly believes, watch what they do. Don't listen to what they say. I applied this principle to myself. Did I act like an atheist? I said that I was, repeatedly. I declared it with great confidence. Yet here I was, in church, listening to a sermon. I was, I told myself, my own kind of atheist. If I didn't believe in God, though, wouldn't that belief be reflected in some way in my conduct? I had been celibate for more years than I cared to consider. Why? It wasn't from a lack of desire. I had endured years of struggle without complaint. Why hadn't I adopted some sort of ethical egoism and just done my own thing? It was clearly my choice. But why did I choose as I did? The answer came quickly. I was living as if God existed, as Jordan Peterson had said. But if I was living that way, then I was not an atheist. No matter what I said or thought, I believed. I almost leapt from the pew. Did I believe in God? The answer came back quickly and unequivocally, no. Yet if I could no longer with honesty declare myself an atheist, where did I stand? Years ago, when I flipped the switch to atheism, I thought of my agnosticism as a wood between the worlds, as in Lewis's magician's nephew. Now I had returned to that place of indecision, not by choice, but by self-confrontation, truth above all. I defaulted to the one intellectually unassailable position on God's existence, that of Socratic ignorance. T.S. Eliot said, the way forward is the way back. The week following my proposal to Jenny at Overlook Pool, Reagan and I were slated to spend with my niece, Bronwyn, and her family camping in the Adirondacks. It was a highlight of our year. This year, though, would be special. Jenny and I were now connected inextricably, and that was my fault. I had just opened a can of dragons for both of us, and it was time to put on the knight's garb and begin the fight for her. But what was the fight? In the weeks and months following my slide into agnosticism, I still had found no way back to belief in God. My first resolve was to justify an unequally yoked marriage, and I marshaled all my capacities to produce an unassailable argument both for Jenny and for anyone else who might object. Upon our admission of love for one another, our text life had become overwhelming. We had both been suppressing our passions, but now they poured forth in an unending stream, powerful and unrelenting. Jenny was as lost, or as found, as was I. And this love, born as it was from the inside out, was the most powerful connective force I've ever felt in my life. Bronwyn and Bill were the two people in all the world best suited to what came next. Both of them had come from broken marriages, from partners who had left them. I deeply admired them as they had accomplished the impossible, successfully blending two families, a total of seven children, and remaining truly in love with one another. That 
was what I wanted. Also, Bronwyn and Bill were Christians. Robust, strong, salt of the earth, engaged in the grid of life, believers. And Bronwyn knew and understood me like few others and had been concerned for my spiritual welfare for years. She had, in fact, promised my mother just recently that she would, quote, keep working on me. All God's preparation was converging on this place and this time. Bronwyn knew immediately that I was in a happy turmoil. I quickly declared my love for Jenny and the seriousness of the quandary I faced. For Braun and Bill, the issue was simple. I was my own worst enemy. My step back from atheism to agnosticism was a move in the right direction, but didn't go far enough. Once or twice a day, I had enough signal on my cell phone to get a text out to Jenny, a pic of our campsite and the setting sun over the lake, words of love and encouragement, pain at being apart, our ongoing struggle to sort out our situation, our passionate discussions word by word, will remain with me forever. To be loved by someone in this manner was unique, powerful, life-transforming and life-giving. I was seeing the world brand new, full again of wonder, magic, and purpose. I was driven forward by the need to be what she needed, to love her as she deserved to be loved. I was beginning to see myself in her eyes as someone who could be loved, who had value and importance for her. I knew what she needed, but I had no way to give it to her. I could not simply decide to reverse a quarter century of disbelief in God without destroying a carefully crafted, crafted narrative of my life. But it was more than that. Truth above all, and at all costs, was my ruling principle. I could not violate that and remain myself, nor be worthy of her love. Bronwyn kept re revolving our conversation around a central theme. Who am I, really? Who have I always been? She'd known me from her childhood onward. What are the patterns of my life? I watched the lives of Braun and Bill with their kids. The love, the commitment to Christ that wasn't ostentatious, but settled in the base of their beings. They lived their faith and their love for God, for each other, for their family. They accepted and welcomed me with all my complexity and sought to love and help me. They enjoyed our company, and I wasn't just a subject for conversion. They listened to my love for Jenny, sympathized with my agony, and emphasized their own lives, joys, struggles, and love for God. Braun kept pointing me back to a central question not what I believed, but how I lived. Over and over again, I was forced to face that I lived as if God existed, no matter what I claimed, whether atheist or agnostic. Jordan Peterson, Kant, Socrates. I was not being logical or honest with myself at the level of life. Sartre's ontological analysis, too, played in my mind. I had exercised faith in atheism for 25 years, approximately the same amount of time I had been a Christian in my youth. Atheism, too, I had discovered to be mere faith. But now, the cowardice of agnosticism loomed again before me. Could I again turn my life upside down? Wouldn't I look the fool? Wouldn't everyone question my motives? Was I even sure of my motives? 
Was I here, now, only because I wanted Jenny? That would be dishonest, and worse, a betrayal of my pearl of great price, to whom I now wish to offer my whole being in purity and truth, truth above all, and at all costs, kept throbbing in my mind. Her eyes, her soul, my looking glass, kept reflecting my image. While others at church prayed for my salvation, Jenny knew Christ held me. She had gently, quietly told me her thoughts on this. What did it matter, though, if God never relinquishes those who once believe, if I no longer had faith in God? What, though, does faith mean? That was again an open question for me, remember? I began to ask myself if all my doubts concerning God's existence were consistent with faith in God. Metaphysical explanation had convinced me that it was more rational to be atheist, but was it? Metaphysics itself is the realm of faith, after all, as Sartre taught me. Had my atheism consisted of faith reinforcing itself? Of course it had. Religious faith does the same. This was one of the realizations that caused me to abandon theism in the first place. The two-edged sword of truth was now cutting both ways. My doubts, then, concerning God's existence were not only consistent with faith in God, but part of the very structure of faith itself. Now, was it true? Or would a renewed faith in God be a return to deception, to bad faith? This became my ongoing stumbling block. What did my actions, my life, tell me? The clear story here was that I believed in God. This faith, Kant told me, was not irrational at all, but another tool in the human toolbox for understanding and living in a reality that infinitely transcends our limitations. Sartre's message was that I encountered God at the ontological level as paradox. As I reviewed my life in the clear air of the Adirondack Mountains, I faced my own self-deception. Seeing God's hand, writing my narrative, leading me here, now. I had privileged objective reasoning and evidence for so long that my subjective responses were profoundly dubious to me. Yet, there was a thread running through all my story, a deep understanding that life is a better index of truth than intellect. When push came to shove in my life, I deferred to Christ. I loved the Christ. He was my ideal, my archetype, my aim. At some level, I had always loved Jesus, even as an atheist, even as, like Peter or Judas, I denied him in the most violent of terms. Pilate's famous question what is truth, is answered, as I came to understand, not in an abstract set of principles, but in a person. Jesus said, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. I had, at one level or another, followed Jesus as the way all my life. Now, I needed to see him as the truth, and here I was stuck, not on proof, for I knew the arguments for God, knew the historical controversies over the historicity of the Bible narrative, but I had dismissed the reality of the supernatural. There was ample reason to believe in God, and ample reason not to, depending upon which narrative was favored. Both sides were rational. For me, hearing more arguments in favor of God's existence was useless. 
I did not need more reason or evidence to believe. I lacked what exactly? Truth? So again, what is truth? We left the Adirondack Mountains on July 20th. I could again text Jenny freely. Her eyes had reflected my image to me over the last week with an intensity I'd never before experienced. Her hearth fires, having burned low, were warming and beckoned to me with joy unspeakable. As I drove homeward, a battle raged within me. My fire-breathing foe had burned me deeply, nearly fatally, but strength from outside me flowed in. Those hearth fires needed my tending. The hedges of my self-confinement were aflame as I battled the dragon of chaos, and the two-edged sword of truth, landing blow after blow upon him, also cut me with surgical precision, cut from me years of accretions, insecurities, arrogance. The joy of battle was upon me. The spirit of the berserker had overtaken me. The joy of battle comes after the first fear of death, said G.K. Chesterton. The fear of death, my foolishness at a total life transformation from atheist to Christian, flamed away in this engagement. If death is the cost of life, I will gladly pay it. I would at least die in battle, in action, and not of apathy. That fear gone, one hurdle only remained, the battle for truth. And for truth, I would gladly play the fool in my own eyes and that of everyone else. Jenny, joy, and truth, or death. The battle lines, at last, were clear and unencumbered. Reagan will tell you that Katy Perry's firework, which had become, for me, Jenny's theme, played nearly uninter uninterrupted all the way home. The last battle raged as we arrived home. Peterson had sketched what was, for me, a reminder of principles I thought I believed and understood. Truth cannot be divorced from human purpose and life. Sartre and other existentialists made this point too. Whatever truth was then, it had to have two separate poles. It had to be human, intimately connected to life, purpose, and meaning. And it had to be something we discovered that was independent of us, something real, extra-human, objective. This is the paradox of truth. Like Odysseus, I had traveled to war and back only to discover myself in the struggle for and the arrival at my home, my looking glass. The last battle resolved as a final puzzle piece snapping into place. Again the answer lay in paradox, the incarnation. Truth in both its aspects is found in Jesus the Christ, fully God, fully human, a paradox that rocked my mind, my world, my understanding. He combined in himself all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and yet was a human being like me. I did not understand. I could not understand. But now I saw this. Lack of understanding was a result of my very finite existence, my limited being, my limited reason in the face of God's totality, my foolishness. My finitude pointed me beyond to the infinite God, 
atheism had been my attempt to flee what to flee what I understood at the level of ontology, not an honest attempt to deal with it. I had lived in bad faith for 25 years. Truth must both be discovered and created. Truth is human and divine. I had sought truth to demystify life, to nail it down, to take its measure. Now I came to understand that ambiguity, mystery, and the infinite complexity that was beyond my finite reason were not problems in the search for truth, but signals that I, by my very nature, stand ignorant and naive in the face of infinite complexity, in the face of God, further up and further in. Truth is an infinite exploration of the divine, not a shutting down to what is known, as knowledge itself is merely a departure from ignorance to a greater understanding of that ignorance. In my flight from foolishness, I had become the greatest of fools, believing myself to be wise. This is the perennial trap of reason. I had left my Christian faith behind as foolishness in my pursuit of wisdom. But that journey, that way in pursuit of truth, brought me back to he who I thought I had left behind but who had traveled every step by my side. That road was long, tortuous, but I came to an end on July 23rd, 2019. In my end was my beginning. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. The way forward, for me, truly was the way back. I am not the same Christian who left the faith all those years ago. The faith I return to is less settled, more complex and nuanced, more imbued with uncertainty, ambiguity, paradox. It is more robust, stronger now, but no longer simple. It remains foolishness for those who do not believe. I am, happily now, a fool for Christ. So bring on the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, the honest doubts, and the malicious attacks. This is the hill I choose to die on. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Jenny and I were resurrected to a new Eden on July 24th, 2019. To say that I love her seems inadequate. That I adore her falls short of my shallowest feelings. She is truly my pearl of great price, for which I sold everything. And in selling, found again the greatest prize of my life. May I love her as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her. I enthusiastically lay down my life at her feet. It is paradox that drove me away from God. It was paradox that led me back. And it is paradox that drives me forward into God's arms, his infinite truth and love beyond measure. Jenny was, and is, my looking glass, and through her, I found Christ again. If this is foolishness, then so be it. Together, Christ is our Lord and our highest meaning. We will serve the Lord. May our service be acceptable in His sight. But if God's holy wisdom is foolish to men, he 
must have seemed out of his mind For even his family said he was mad And the priest said a demon's to blame But God in the form of this angry young man Could not have seemed perfectly sane This is the first edition of The Christian Atheist you have seen. Please subscribe to our channel below to make sure you don't miss future episodes. This was the second of a concluding pair of episodes for a series entitled The Machinery of the Looking Glass, seven episodes in all, detailing my journey back to Christ from atheism. You can view these and other episodes from our YouTube channel. Your comments and concerns are encouraged and welcomed. First, if you like this video, please like and subscribe, and let us know what you'd like to hear from us by commenting. Wise Words for Your Occasion is located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, but we're willing to travel. For inquiries or to book an occasion, go to wisewordsforyouroccasion.wordpress.com or see us on Facebook, or check out our YouTube channel. You'll find links to all three in this post.